1985, 36-year-old Michael Reamer was a roofer in Tacoma, Washington, and his boss described him as being a work hard, play hard type of guy. In the winter months when there really wasn't any roofing to be done, Mike would supplement his income by trapping coyote, mink, and muskrat in the forest that butted up against the Nisqually River, which was an 80 mile stretch that ran right near his home. Most of the traps Mike would set would be far away from any actual trail because wherever there was a trail, you would have human foot traffic and that would scare away the animals that you're trying to catch in your trap. And so as a result, he would place his traps in very remote, you know, isolated sections of the forest which meant he needed to know where those sections were. And so over the 15 years he spent trapping in this forest, he got really, really good at navigating it. It was like he had a map in his head of where everything was in this forest. Plus, Mike was already an avid outdoorsman, and so navigating a forest and being out in the wild was something that just kind of came naturally to him. Mike's girlfriend was a 21-year-old woman named Diana Robertson, and they had a two-year-old daughter named Crystal. Mike and Diana had a rocky relationship, to say the least. In fact, in October of that year, Diana had filed a restraining order against Mike after he had kicked in the door and thrown her to the ground. Mike also always carried a gun on him, and he had a very quick temper. But despite their significant relationship issues, the one thing they could always see eye to eye on was their daughter, Crystal. They adored her. And when it came to decisions about her, they were always on the same page. It was whatever is in the best interest of Crystal. In December of that year, Diana and Mike were able to reconcile. And so Diana threw the restraining order out. And in fact, she and Crystal moved back in with Mike, which made Crystal very, very happy. Just a couple of days after moving back in, they decided they wanted to go out and go camping together as a family. And then also also pick out a real Christmas tree they could bring back for the holidays. And so they settled on an area that was going to be in the same forest where Mike had all of his traps set and they figured they could, you know, get their family time in, they could get their Christmas tree and Mike would be able to check his traps, saving himself from making another trip later on. So on December 12th, the three of them loaded up into Mike's red pickup truck and they drove the 30 minutes down towards Nisqually River where there was this logging road that Mike would use to park his truck and then walk in to check his traps. So Mike pulls over on the side of the road. They all hop out and Mike leads the way right into the middle of the woods. There's no trail. Mike is just bringing them to an area where one, his traps will be, and two, he thinks is suitable for camping and for looking for a Christmas tree. Later that afternoon, Crystal was spotted walking around a parking lot of a Kmart 20 miles away from where Mike had parked the car near Nisqually River. And she's just walking around. She looks totally confused. She's all alone. And the employees of the Kmart are looking out and they see this girl and they're all watching, waiting for, you know, her parents or a guardian or someone to walk over and show that they are with this girl. But after a couple of minutes, when no one does that, one of the employees goes out and tries to talk to her. And this employee would say when she talked to the girl, she kept looking over her shoulder and she was just terrified the whole time. And so this employee asked her, you know, what's your name? And she didn't say anything. She asked her, you know, where are you coming from? You know, where are your parents? Who's looking after you? And to all the questions she was asked, she didn't say anything. She just looked terrified and was looking over her shoulder. And so this employee brings the girl back inside and they call the police. And so the police show up and they ask the girl the same questions that the employees have been asking her and the girl's still not speaking. And so after they made an announcement inside to say, hey, is anybody in here, the parent or guardian of this child and no one came forward, they said, okay, well, we have no other choice, but we're gonna have to move her to temporary foster care. And so they move her to a foster home and then they put an ad out in the newspaper that day with a picture of her, basically saying, if you know me, contact this number. Two days later, Crystal's maternal grandmother would see the picture in the newspaper and the ad did not have a description of, you know, how she was discovered. It just said she had been found at this particular Kmart. And if you know who she is, please contact this number. Even without the details, the grandmother knows something has gone wrong because there's no reason in the world those two parents would abandon their beloved Crystal. And so she calls Diana, she calls Mike, they don't pick up the phone. That's when she calls the number and she says, what's going on? I'm her grandmother, where is she? The police tell her to go to the foster home and they will meet her there and they're gonna talk about what happened. So the grandmother flies to the foster home and she arrives there before the police she goes inside and Crystal is so happy to see her. It's the first time Crystal has really broken out of that kind of catatonic state she had been in ever since she was found at the Kmart. And so she runs up to her grandmother, they have this reunion and the grandmother's so happy to see Crystal, but she's also thinking, where are your parents? Where are Diana and Mike? And so she asks Crystal, where are they, honey? Where is your mom? Where's your dad? 
and Crystal would speak to her grandmother and she would say, mommy's in the trees. Her grandmother didn't know what this meant and so she tried to ask clarifying questions, but Crystal was not very verbal. She was not able to articulate more than what she was saying. So she just kept repeating it, saying, mommy's in the trees, mommy's in the trees. And so then the police show up and the grandmother turns to them and she says, where are her parents? Where are Mike and Diana? And the police turn to her and they're like, we don't know. We found her abandoned in this parking lot and she wasn't speaking and no one knew anything about her. And so until right now, we didn't even know her parents' names. Do you have any idea where they might be? And the grandmother's like, I have no idea. I mean, I'm just learning about all of this stuff now. But when I came over here, Crystal said to me, mommy's in the trees. And you know, she's not, she's not very verbal, so she can't explain much more than that but she just kept saying mommy's in the trees. And I know Mike liked to go camping in this one area near the Nisqually River. He keeps traps out near the edge of the water. He, he catches some small animals out there. So I know he goes out there and goes camping. And so maybe that's what Crystal's referencing, that they were in the trees. So they were in that forest over there. The grandmother also gave the police the address to Mike's house and the police use that information to launch their search for the parents. And so the first place they go is Mike's house and all the lights are off, the door is locked, and his red pickup truck, because the grandmother said he drove a red pickup truck, his red pickup truck is not there. And so they rule out his house, they're not there, and they begin flying a plane, not only over Tacoma, which is the area where they were living, but also over that forest that was right up against the Nisqually River. And as they're flying, they're looking for campsites that could potentially be Mike and Diana, but they're also looking for the red pickup truck, which is fairly distinctive. And after a couple of days of flying all over the forest and looking around the side streets and, and putting people in the forest walking on foot, they couldn't find anything and they turned the search off. And they would tell the grandmother and the rest of the family on Diana's and Mike's side that they really just needed to wait for more information to come in because they couldn't just spend an indefinite amount of time scanning a fairly large area. They have all of Tacoma and this huge forest. And so everyone just had to wait. Two months later, a man and his dog were out walking on this logging road that was about 10 miles away from the Nisqually River and 30 miles away from the Kmart where Crystal was found. And they're walking on this road and they see way off in the distance, there's this truck that's pulled over to the side of this road. And even from a distance, they can tell it's covered in snow but it hasn't snowed recently. There's, there's snow on the ground, but the amount of snow that is on this truck indicates it's been sitting here for quite a while. And so as they get closer to the truck, this man is looking around, seeing if maybe the owner is nearby, even though it seemed unlikely given the fact that it looks like it's been sitting here a while. And so after he stands there for a minute, looking around, feeling pretty confident there's no one in the area, he brushes the snow off the passenger side window and he looks inside and he doesn't see anything at first, but he notices on the passenger front seat, there's a significant amount of blood on the seat or what appears to be blood. And this startles the guy. So he backs up from it and he and his dog very quickly leave this area because they're in this kind of desolate, you know, logging road. He's pretty isolated. And so he gets out of there as quickly as he can. And when he gets to a phone, he calls the police. Police show up and they brush the rest of the snow off and they find it is a red pickup truck. It's Mike's red pickup truck. Mike and Diana's case had been very big news in the area when it happened. And the news had really not gone away. People were out there looking for this couple. And so as soon as they saw this was Mike's truck, they start fanning out and searching the area, seeing if they can find any other clues about what happened to Mike and Diana. And very quickly, they discover Diana's body. She was located not far from the red truck, just barely off the road in the forest. She was under several inches of snow and she had been stabbed 17 times and there was a tube sock wrapped around her neck. There was no sign of Mike, but once they got inside the truck, there was a manila folder that had been tucked up on the dashboard that just said, I love you, Diana. When police showed that message to Diana's family, they all said, that looks like Mike's handwriting. He used to send us handwritten Christmas cards and that looks exactly the way he writes. As for the blood that was on the passenger seat inside the truck, it had been sitting out for too long, so they weren't able to determine whose blood it was, but they were able to determine it was human. So between the blood on the front seat, the note that was left on the dashboard, the personal furious nature of the way in which Diana was killed, combined with Mike's history of violence and his disappearance, because he's not here anymore, that all made it seem an awful lot like Mike was the guy that did this. In fact, this made for a very tidy ending to a mystery that had actually started before Diana had been killed. On August 10th, 1985, so four months before Mike, Diana, and Crystal ventured off into the woods near Nisqually River, 
27-year-old Stephen Harkins and his girlfriend, 42-year-old Ruth Cooper, were going camping near Nisqually River in the same forest. They were actually about 15 miles from where Diana's body was ultimately found, and they were very close to a number of Mike's traps, although they probably didn't realize they were near them. During their trip, an unknown assailant walked up to their campsite in the middle of the night and shot them both to death. Stephen was found right away, and he was found inside of his sleeping bag at their campsite, indicating he had been killed in his sleep. Ruth wasn't found for months and when she was she was found a mile and a half away from the campsite and she had a tube sock tied around her neck the same way Diana had and the knot that was used on the tube sock was even the same as the knot used on Diana's tube sock so the similarity was just too much to overlook and so to the police they're thinking Mike has to be the guy in both of these cases you know he attacked Ruth and Stephen, perhaps because they were you know, on his territory where his traps were and he didn't like that. You know, he has a history of violence and so he attacks them. And then a couple months later, he attacks Diana and then he flees. As for his daughter being found alive at the Kmart, it would seem he just did not have it in him to harm his own child. And so he dropped her off at the Kmart before he ultimately fled. Despite everything seeming to fit just perfectly to where, yep, Mike is definitely the guy, not only for Diana, but for Ruth and for Steven, we figured it out. Despite that being the overwhelming feeling, there were a couple of questions that remained unanswered. Like the FBI, they were unable to confirm the handwriting on that folder that said, I love you, Diana. They were unable to confirm that that in fact was Mike's handwriting. Diana's family was really convinced it was his, but the FBI said it's not necessarily a match. And then you have the motives for the two crimes. We can understand one of them. Him attacking Diana, unfortunately, people attack their partners all the time. And so we can, we can understand that, we can rationalize that. But for him to attack Ruth and Steven, two total strangers, because what, they encroached on your land, even though it's not your land, it's public land, and you just happen to put your traps out there, that didn't seem like a strong enough reason for him to want to kill them. But the circumstantial evidence was overwhelmingly pointing at Mike being the guy. You have the fact that he's this violent guy with a history of domestic abuse. He knows this area well where both crimes were committed. You have the tube sock tied around Diana the same way it's tied around Ruth. It just had to be Mike. And so because the police felt so strongly it had to be Mike, they were willing to overlook these lingering questions. And so the police wanted to issue an arrest warrant for Mike, but they needed to be able to prove he was alive because if he was dead, then that calls into question his ability to have committed these two crimes. And so they didn't have proof he was alive. And so very quickly, this story faded out of the headlines because basically everybody believed Mike had done it and he had run off somewhere and maybe someday we'll figure out where he went and we'll bring him to justice. But until then, we know he's the guy. For years, no one heard from Mike, no one saw Mike. It was like he had just totally vanished. Crystal was raised by relatives and many of the detectives that were working on these cases eventually retired or moved on. Then 25 years later, in March of 2011, a hiker was walking through the forest near the Nisqually River, about one mile from where Diana's body was found, and they would stumble upon a piece of a human skull. She calls the police, police show up, they search the area and they discover another bone, a human jawbone and it would turn out it was Mike's. The rest of Mike's remains were never found, and because there was so little of him to work with, police were not able to determine a cause of death. However, they were able to date his death back to almost exactly the same time frame that Diana had died. Additionally, investigators believe the reason they did not find more of Mike's remains is because he had been buried. The two bones that were found, the skull and the jawbone, they were located within one mile of where Diana's body had been found. And that area, after Diana had been found, had been scoured. They looked everywhere for clues. And because he apparently died at the same time she did, he would have been out there and they would have found him. So the fact that they didn't find him can only mean he was underground. So this all meant Mike could not have been the killer because in order for him to have been the killer, he not only would have had to attack Diana and then drive his daughter to the Kmart and then drive back to the forest, he would then need to take his own life and then also somehow bury himself. Some of the police officers that had worked that case were still on the police force. And so when they heard this news about Mike not being the killer, they were like, you know, it never really made any sense that he would attack Ruth or Steven unless he was a serial killer. And then it clicked. They probably were dealing with a serial killer. 
It just wasn't Mike. And their only eyewitness was the toddler, Crystal, who apparently the serial killer could not bring themselves to harm. And so as a result, Crystal just sat there and watched these horrible things happen to her parents and then probably spent a fair amount of time with the serial killer afterwards because they needed to drive her to the Kmart. Investigators and her family had tried to get her to give more information about what she had witnessed, but all she could say was, mommy's in the trees. And so there are really only two interpretations of what that means. Either one, she was just stating that her mother was in the forest and that would have been accurate. Or she's remembering her mother trying to escape a serial killer by climbing up into a tree. Or maybe even that she was in the tree with her mother as they both were trying to escape a serial killer with a knife. So when the police have this revelation that Mike was not the killer, that in fact, it was probably a serial killer, and we know nothing about this serial killer besides what Crystal had to say as a toddler, and that didn't provide any sort of real clarity on who this person was or what their MO was, they went back and looked at all the unsolved murders in the Pacific Northwest, specifically around this forest. They discovered that in addition to Mike and Diana and Ruth and Steven, there were four other sets of couples that were killed in and around this forest, and all of them bared striking resemblances to one another. The most recent attack that is associated with the Tube Sock Killer occurred in 2006, but the reality is police don't really know anything about the Tube Sock Killer. All they know is that they're probably in the Pacific Northwest and they are definitely still at large. On April 28, 2000, a 24-year-old named Yuri Lipsky was standing in front of a cafe in Dahab, Egypt, overlooking the Red Sea. He had traveled all the way to the Sinai Peninsula from Moscow in order to film himself swimming through the arch, but now it was looking like that probably wasn't going to happen. The arch is an 85-foot-long underwater tunnel that connects a massive sinkhole right on Dahab's shoreline called the Blue Hole to the Red Sea. To get to the arch, you need to enter the Blue Hole directly and descend straight down 181 feet where you'll reach the top of the tunnel on the northeast side. But there's a catch. If on your descent you happen to miss the ceiling of this arch, which apparently it's pretty easy to do, you run the risk of going too deep. Now, going too deep does not mean you're going to miss the tunnel altogether. The arch actually starts at 181 feet, but then goes all the way down to 393 feet. So it's a huge, huge opening. The risk of going too deep has to do with how your body responds to the type of gas you're breathing. For those who are unfamiliar with diving, generally speaking, you have two types of dives. There's recreational diving, where you breathe the same air that you breathe on the surface. They literally jam air directly directly into scuba bottles, you breathe that and you go down to 130 feet. That's the recommended bottom depth that you would go down breathing regular air. And then there is technical diving where you breathe a special mixture of gases. Typically it's gonna be a mixture of helium, nitrogen and oxygen that allow you to go below 130 feet. This type of diving is exponentially more dangerous and requires all sorts of additional training. Because the minimum depth you would need to go to in order to access the arch is 181 feet, that puts you well in the technical diving range, which means you should be diving mixed gas and have special training and equipment. But year after year, people try to dive down to the arch and go through it on regular air. And year after year, people die doing it. When your body absorbs too much nitrogen, you can get something called nitrogen narcosis, which is a lot like being drunk. And in extreme cases, divers who get this have been known to remove their mouthpiece and inhale water, believing they are actually on the surface. Below 130 feet, your body absorbs nitrogen much faster, and regular air is a whopping 78% nitrogen. So the risk of getting nitrogen narcosis is exponentially higher if you're breathing regular air below 130 feet. Also, oxygen can become toxic the deeper you go in the water column. It can lead to blackouts and convulsions that if you don't have someone there to literally physically move you up in the water column, you won't recover from it and you'll die. Regular air contains 21% oxygen, which is a lot of oxygen. So if you're diving regular air below 130 feet, you are at an increased risk of developing O2 toxicity. Now, to be clear, it is possible on regular air to dive down to 181 feet and make it through the arch and come out the other side and be just fine. But you're realistically at 181 feet 
pushing the absolute boundary of what you can get away with on regular air. Below 200 feet, you're probably dead. So if you're attempting to swim through the arch on regular air, you need to be paying very close attention to your depth as you descend so that you don't miss the arch and accidentally drift down below 181 feet to the very deadly 200 feet and beyond. So earlier in the day, Yuri had gone down to the edge of the blue hole and he had found one of the diving instructors that taught inside the blue hole. His name was Tarek Omar. And he asked him if he'd be willing to take him down to the arch to help him film himself going through the arch. And Tarek said, yes, but I need to train you for two weeks before you're gonna be considered qualified to do that. And you need a special setup with a special gas mixture to do this dive. And Yuri was like, well, I'm leaving in two days to head back to Moscow, so I need to do this dive now. Is, is there any way you can do it today or tomorrow even? And Tarek was like, no, that's not how this works. And Tarek understood this more than anybody else, because in addition to teaching diving at the Blue Hole, Tarek's job was to dive down to the bottom and retrieve the dead bodies of inexperienced or overconfident divers that attempted the archway and didn't make it. Although there is not an official body count of how many people have perished inside of the Blue Hole, locals believe it's as high as 200 people just in the last decade. After Tarek was unwilling to take him without properly training him and outfitting him with the right equipment, Yuri thanked him and went on to a couple different other diving instructors with the same request. Will you take me in the next couple of days? And they all said, no, we need to train you and you need special equipment. And so finally, after no one was willing to do this, Yuri just left. Later that day, owners of cafes that overlooked the blue hole remember seeing a young man who was by himself walk to the edge of the blue hole. He puts on all of his scuba gear. He puts on a helmet and then straps a big camera to the top and ratchets it down. And then after he's got all his stuff on, he jumps into the blue hole and he disappears. That man was Yuri. A few days later, Yuri's family back home in Moscow did not see him get off the flight he was supposed to be on and they reported him missing. Tarek Omar was contacted to go down into the blue hole and see if Yuri was down there. Tarek hopped in the blue hole, he went to the bottom, and sure enough, lying face down at the bottom was Yuri. When they brought Yuri to the surface, they realized his camera had been running the whole time, and he had actually filmed his final moments. Yuri's final video exists online, so you can watch it for yourself, but here is a description of what happens. After situating his camera on his head just the way he wanted it, he hit record, and then he jumped into the water. It was determined later on that Yuri was breathing regular air out of his tanks. The camera submerges under the water, and then Yuri begins to sink very quickly into the blue hole, but his breathing seems normal, and he's not thrashing around, so it seems like it's a controlled descent. But at some point, you hear Yuri trying to activate his buoyancy compensator. Basically, it's this life jacket, to describe it simply, that sits on your gear that you have a demand valve where you can inflate and deflate the air into it to neutralize your buoyancy. Or in an emergency situation, you can fully inflate it and stop yourself from sinking. In fact, you'll rise to the surface. But he's trying to activate his buoyancy compensator to slow down his descent and the air is escaping his compensator. There's a leak, he can't slow down his descent. Now, Yuri was wearing a weight belt, which is very common in diving. In fact, I don't really know of all that many dives that you wouldn't use a weight belt. And any diver knows that there is a quick release function on your weight belt. Specifically, if you're in an uncontrolled descent or if you're in an emergency situation and need to get to the surface, you can jettison your weight belt and go to the surface. But Yuri was panicking and he was fixated on his buoyancy compensator that he was desperately trying to activate and it was failing. And so he's not going for his weight belt. And then he rockets past the entrance to the arch. So he goes below 181 feet, he goes below 200 feet, and he goes all the way to the bottom where he hits the bottom at 390. 92 feet and then he begins to slide because the bottom of the blue hole was actually at an angle and that archway went all the way to the bottom of the hole and if you slipped out of the blue hole it was a sheer drop off for thousands of feet and you see on camera Yuri rolls over and he's desperately clawing into the mud to stop himself from sliding out of the blue hole to definite death then he's trying to get himself to stop and finally he anchors himself in the dirt and it's calm for a second and he's kind of looking around it's very clear he's confused and then it goes still. And it's believed at this point, he either removed his mouthpiece because of nitrogen narcosis, you know, he pulled it out and inhaled water, or he was dealing with O2 toxicity and he blacked out and the mouthpiece came out. But either way, he drowned. Situated an hour's drive from Johannesburg in South Africa lies Sturkfontein Cave. 
The cave is famous for the fossils that have been found there and also for its underground lake whose walls look like Swiss cheese. There's all these tunnels that spider all over the place. Many of them are unexplored and no one knows how deep the cave actually goes. In 1984, cave diver Peter Verhussel, along with two of his friends, decided they wanted to explore these passageways in the lake and specifically they wanted to check out a chamber called Milner Hall, which was fairly far down in the lake. There was a guideline that was anchored from the surface of the lake all the way down into the different sections that had been explored. And this was so cave divers could hold on to it and make their way through without getting lost. Not that I've ever been cave diving, but from what I've read, there is one golden rule. You never let go of the guideline. And if you do, it better be extremely well planned and you should do it with other divers present. Peter was a notorious risk taker and was the least experienced cave diver of the three. When they entered the lake, they were all holding the guideline and Peter was the third back. And so they began descending down into the lake and at some point, Peter's curiosity got the better of him and he left the line to go look at the wall where there was you know, something he wanted to look at. And luckily the other two divers noticed it, they saw him and they swam over and got him and brought him back to the guideline. And even though you can't communicate underwater, I'm sure they looked at him like, come on, don't do that. And they kept going down and then once again, Peter's curiosity gets the better of him. He leaves the guideline and goes over and checks something else out. The other two divers notice again, they turn around, they grab him and they pull him back. And now they're looking at him like, you can't do this, no more. And so Peter's body language indicated that he got it and he was back on the guideline. He's not gonna do it again. And they continue down and they're getting closer to Milner Hall when the first two turn around to check on Peter and he's gone. And now previously when they found him those other two times when he left the guideline, he was just over right against the wall and he was easy to spot. But this time he wasn't. They're looking around with their lights and he's nowhere to be found. And they're not prepared to go leave into one of these tunnels to go looking for him because there were so many. It was like Swiss cheese down there with all these different tunnels he could have gone into and they didn't know which one he went in. And so after kind of waiting and looking around for a couple of minutes, thinking maybe he'll come back, they were running out of air and they had to go to the surface. So the two men surface, they call the police, they explain what happened. Rescue divers are sent to the cave to go looking for Peter. But by the time they even got there, it had been several hours. It takes a while to mount this type of search. And Peter only had one tank of air. And so if he hasn't surfaced by now, the thought is he's drowned at this point. But the rescue divers go into the lake, they head down to the area where Peter was last seen and they look around and they can't find him and they surface pretty quickly and they say look we're just not prepared to look through all these different tunnels he could have gone in just to find his body because at this point there's no way he's alive he's been down here for hours he doesn't have enough air and one of us one of the rescue divers is going to get trapped in one of these tunnels and we don't want to lose anyone so we're terminating the search peter's friends are devastated and they say hey can you let us go down and look for peter's body for his family and the police said, no, we're banning diving in this cave. Six weeks after Peter went missing inside of this lake, a group of dry cavers were doing some work in a chamber that was right next to this underground lake. And they were chiseling this wall when all of a sudden the wall kind of collapsed, revealing another chamber on the other side of this wall. They took their flashlight out and they looked inside and it looked like a tunnel that kind of weaved around the corner. And they shined their light on the ground and it looked like there were some muddy or sandy footprints that were left as if someone had been walking right there. The cavers were initially terrified, the idea that there's anything living behind the walls inside of a cave. But they stepped over and they walked around the corner and it revealed this huge air pocket that clearly was connected to the underground lake because there was water right in the middle of this air pocket and there was no other way in besides, you know, this wall that's collapsed. And in the middle of the water, there was this island. It was like this sandy, muddy, rocky island right in the middle of this air pocket. And laying on the island was Peter. In a stroke of luck, after Peter went missing from his dive, he had discovered this air pocket and he had surfaced and climbed onto this island. He knew he didn't have enough air in his air tank to get to the surface again. And so he figured, okay, I'll just sit on this island. There seems to be enough air in here for me. I'll wait until my dive buddies invariably go get help and come down here and rescue me. He sat inside of that air pocket for three weeks waiting for a rescue that never arrived. Before he ultimately died of starvation, he wrote a message in the sand to his mother and to his wife telling them that he loved them. To this day, diving is still prohibited inside of Sterkfontein Cave. A little after 1.30 in the morning on June 17th, 2017, 34 U.S. Navy sailors were asleep inside of birthing compartment number two on the USS Fitzgerald. 
their birthing compartment was below the waterline, meaning where they were sleeping was underwater. They were sailing along through the South China Sea when all of a the sudden there is this explosion in the birthing compartment and a rush of cold air. The explosion was a 30,000 ton container ship crashing into them, gouging an opening in their wall bigger than a semi-truck. Before any of the 34 sailors could make sense of what was happening, tens of thousands of gallons of seawater are pouring into their compartment. The sailors were sleeping in what they called coffin lock which were these bunk beds where the bunks were stacked three high and the lowest bunk was practically on the ground. And so as soon as the water came pouring into the room, everybody who was sleeping on a lower bunk was immediately completely submerged in water and all the furniture inside of the space was lifted up by the rush of water and a few unlucky sailors who were in those bottom bunks were trapped by furniture that landed right in front of their bunk. The sailors immediately jumped into action, leaping out of their bunks, pulling people out of those lower bunks. Everybody's trying to help each other out to get to the exit, which was a ladder that led up to a hatch in the ceiling. The sailors inside of the space were very close with each other. Pretty much 24 hours a day, they were always within a few feet of each other. And so that explains why as the water was rising and rising, getting up to their necks, they formed an orderly line as they all made their way up this ladder through this hatch. As they waited in line to get out of the space, the water was getting so high that they were tilting their heads to barely be able to breathe the space that was left inside of the room. And when the water is really cold, you involuntarily open your mouth. And so water was pouring into their mouths, making it very hard to breathe. As each man climbed the ladder and went through the hatch to relative safety, they would turn around and help the next guy up. And they remembered hearing this hissing sound, which was the sound of all the air being forced out of the compartment through this hatch as it filled with seawater. And then finally, the survivors that had made it out of the hatch were able to pull the last few guys that were in line to go up the ladder. They pulled them out and then they realized they're short eight sailors. But they're faced with this terrible decision because they need to shut the hatch and seal it. It's a procedure inside of a sinking ship to keep it from sinking. If they don't shut this compartment, they run the risk of killing more people on board the ship. And so they decide they're gonna wait for a couple of extra seconds and they begin yelling, come to the sound of my voice in hopes that anybody that's still down there could hear them through the water and would swim to them. And then before they shut it, they poked their head down and looked and they saw a glimmer of what looked like a man swimming away from the ladder. And they're thinking, why are they swimming away? Don't they know they need to come here? And they're yelling to this person, come back, come back, swim to our voice. And then moments later, this burly sailor from Arizona named John Mead came out of the darkness and clambered up the ladder and they pull him out and he's coughing and he's gagging and he said, Gary Ream saved me. I was behind a locker, he pulled me out. And it dawned on the two sailors that saw that man swimming away from the ladder farther into the compartment that they had tried to stop, that they had tried to, to get back to them, that wasn't John Mead, that was Gary Ream. He was intentionally swimming back to save these guys. But now in a cruel twist of fate, they had to seal the hatch with Gary and six others still inside. At 37 years old, Gary Ream was a veteran of the ship. He referred to the other sailors as his kids, and when they were on land, he would invite them over to his house for holiday meals. He was approaching 20 years of service and he was planning to retire soon and move back to Virginia with his family and become a fireman. Gary was asleep inside of birthing compartment number two when the crash happened. And instead of going up the ladder to safety, which he could have done, he was near the ladder, he instead decided to make multiple trips into the far back section of the compartment, which is where the most people were trapped by furniture, either in their bunks or in the bathroom stalls. And he went back over and over and over again, knowing full well that once this water reaches the ceiling, they are going to seal the hatch. He's been in the Navy almost 20 years. He knows the procedure, but Gary loved his kids and he was prepared to die for them. And on this day, he did. 19 of the 27 surviving sailors credit Gary for saving their life. On 14, 1950, two-year-old Jackie Copeland was playing with his three older sisters at a picnic in Pleasantville, Pennsylvania. This picnic was for Jackie's father's company, so there was lots of parents and lots of other kids there, and it was located on this hillside that was right up against a very swampy forest. Jackie's parents had been keeping an eye on Jackie and his three sisters while simultaneously trying to have conversations with some of the adults. And at one point, they got so sucked into a particular conversation that for a little while, they were not looking at their kids. 
credits. And when they finally stopped talking to this person and turned to look, Jackie was gone. In a panic, the parents rush over to the daughters and they ask them, you know, where's your brother? Where's Jackie? And they say, oh, we don't know. And the parents turn around and it's just a sea of people and other kids and it's just chaos. And so Jackie's father just yells to the group, I can't find my son, help me find my son. And so very quickly, the whole picnic starts looking for Jackie Copeland. After about 15 minutes, when over 100 people looking could not find any trace of Jackie, his parents called the state police. The police showed up in force with bloodhounds and they began looking all around the area, but the dogs couldn't pick up a scent and they, like the rest of the hundreds of volunteers, could not find any indication of where Jackie might have gone. The assumption was he must have wandered off into the forest, but after being in the forest and looking around and seeing how difficult it was to navigate because it was basically just this big swamp, they figured we're bound to run into him here because he just can't have gotten very far. But that night when the sun went down, they still hadn't found Jackie and they still had no leads. And so the police and most of the volunteers had to suspend the search until the next day when there was daylight. And so Jackie's parents and some really hardcore supporters, they stayed out all night just yelling for Jackie and continuing to look, even though it was nearly impossible with no light. The following morning when the search was picked up again, there was a crew of people that were way outside the boundaries of what was considered the main search area. They were two miles into the swampy forest at this oil repressuring plant. The plant itself was situated on this one stretch of dry land in the middle of this forest where basically all around it was this impassable, almost moat-like swamp where the water was particularly deep right around the edges. The searchers were not on plant property. They were on the other side of that deep swamp water just looking at the plant. And one of the searchers happened to notice a child was poking their head around the back of a tree that was right next to the plant. It was like the child was peering at the searchers before tucking itself back behind the tree. The searchers couldn't believe it and they rushed over to the plant and sure enough, it was Jackie Copeland. Jackie was sent to a hospital and a doctor examined him and said he just had a couple of scratches on him. But other than that, he was in great health. A local newspaper called the Logansport Press followed up with the Copeland family after they were reunited with their son. And they wanted to know what everybody else wanted to know. How did your son get through two miles of impassable swampland onto this plant that even adults have difficulty getting to? In the article, the parents said after they got their son back from the hospital and they got him home and you know fed and cleaned up, they asked him, you know, what happened? How did you get where you got? And they would say, although he's two years old and he spoke in you know child speak, kind of like child gibberish. His story was very consistent every time they asked him and they asked him repeatedly. And so his story was they were at the picnic and he was looking into the forest and he saw someone peering from behind a tree at him. And Jackie felt like this person or this creature wanted him to come into the forest. And so he got up and he walked to the forest. And as he got closer to this creature or person behind the tree, they scampered farther into the forest. And so Jackie pursued them. And so as Jackie continued to walk towards this person or creature who kept vanishing farther and farther into the woods, he said he reached an area that he called the awful dark. And when he was in the awful dark, he said there were all these wild animals around him that he couldn't see that were howling and barking at him, but they wouldn't get closer to him because he was with a giant. And this giant led him through the forest and led him to this plant. While it's easy to discount this story because it's being told by a two-year-old who does not understand everything they just went through, what's not easy to discount is how Jackie wound up two miles away on this plant, which meant he would have crossed a two-mile stretch of impassable swamp. That's what the police were saying. That's what the searchers were saying. It's not possible for a two-year-old to cover this distance. So the only rational explanation is Jackie had help getting to this plant. And it's also interesting to consider the fact that when Jackie was found by the searcher at the plant, he described Jackie as peering from behind a tree, like he was kind of hiding from the searcher. It's the same behavior that Jackie described this person or creature doing to him when he was at the picnic. And so between Jackie's story staying fairly consistent for a two-year-old and him mimicking the behavior of that person or creature he saw in the tree line, it's led people to speculate that while Jackie certainly may not understand who or what was calling him into the woods, that there's a real possibility that there really was someone or something that was watching Jackie from the tree line and got him to come into the forest.
On February 7, 1970, 16-year-old Jeff Haig was hiking along the Appalachian Trail with his Boy Scout troop. Jeff had been a Boy Scout for three years and he had been on similar hikes in the past, and so he was very comfortable with hiking, with camping, and being outdoors. The hike they had planned was only about two miles long, and it was a beginner trail that was very well marked, and it was broad daylight, so it was a very easy hike to make. About three quarters of the way through their hike, the Scoutmaster had the group stop and sit down and take a break, and Jeff wound up being the last one to kind of make it into this rest stop. He had kind of fallen behind the group, he looked tired and ragged, and the Scoutmaster asked him, you know, are you okay? Do you need food? Do you need water? And Jeff would say, he's just fine, he's just a little bit tired. And so after a few minutes, when the group was getting ready to stand back up again and start hiking again, one of the senior scouts was not done eating, and so they asked the Scoutmaster if they could be the last to leave the site and meet up with them farther down the trail. Scoutmaster said that was fine, you know, we're, we're pretty close to the end of the hike anyways, and so we'll see you in a few minutes. And so Jeff, the Scoutmaster, the rest of the troop, they all get up, they start hiking down the trail, while this one senior scout stays back to finish eating. After only a few minutes of walking down the trail, Jeff once again began falling to the back of the line until he finally stopped and he called out to the Scoutmaster and said, you know, he's not feeling great, he's going to sit down in the middle of the trail and wait for the senior scout, who he knew was still eating at the rest stop, he said he was going to wait for him to catch up with him, and then he and the senior scout would walk together the rest of the way. Now, at this point, the scoutmaster's thinking they're only about, you know, five, ten minutes from the end of the hike, and so he didn't want him to sit there, but he figured, okay, he's tired, the senior scout's going to be coming through this really well-marked trail any minute, so not a big deal. And he told Jeff, no big deal. We'll see at the end. And so the scoutmaster, along with the other scouts, makes their way to the end of the trail, which comes to an end in a parking lot. They turn around and they just wait for Jeff and the senior scout to come out of the trail. A couple of minutes later, the senior scout emerges, but there's no Jeff. And so the scoutmaster goes over to him and he says, you know, where's Jeff? And the senior scout is like, what? I didn't see Jeff. I, I was alone and then I walked down the trail and I, I didn't see anyone. And so the scoutmaster's like, Jeff was sitting in the middle of the trail, like maybe a couple hundred meters away from you. He was waiting for you. And the senior scout says, no, I, I didn't see him. And so in a panic, the scoutmaster and the rest of the scouts ran back up the trail because it wasn't that far to get back to that rest stop. And they're looking for signs of Jeff the whole way and there's none. At the rest stop, they turned around and were yelling for Jeff the whole way back down to the parking lot. And again, they didn't see him. So they hopped in the van they had left in this parking lot and they drove to the park headquarters where they informed park services that they're missing one of their scouts. The park service immediately sent teams out to the area where Jeff had gotten lost and they called the police who sent out a whole nother crew of people to assist in the search. Considering how well marked the trail was, everybody was baffled that Jeff could get lost so quickly and so completely. Luckily, Jeff had a pack on that contained warm clothes, a sleeping bag, food, water, and matches. And so they're looking around and there's snow on the ground and it's already starting to snow some more. And they're thinking, you know, he does have basic survival skills and he's got some supplies. He should be able to survive on his own out here for a couple of days if we can't find him. Over the following week, despite hundreds of people out looking for Jeff in this area, they couldn't find him. And making matters worse is the temperature was plummeting every single day to the point where every night was well below freezing. On the 16th, almost exactly a week from when Jeff went missing, they made a big discovery. They found his pack sitting on a rock in the middle of this icy river where the only way it could have been placed on this rock is if he was standing in the water, which would have been at least waist deep. And even more strangely is all the contents of the bag had been pulled out and placed neatly on the rock as if someone was taking careful inventory of what was inside. And it didn't look like anything was missing. Although at the time there was no good theory as to why the pack was where it was and why it looked the way it did, what basically everyone could agree to at this point is now that Jeff does not have his supplies, he's almost certainly dead or going to die soon. And sure enough, two days later, Jeff's body was found approximately a thousand meters upstream of where the pack had been found in the river. Jeff was found sitting up against a tree, his jacket was unzipped, his pants were unzipped and pulled down slightly, he did not have a hat on, he didn't have gloves on, he had removed his socks but put one of his boots back on. His body didn't have any scratches on it and he didn't have any broken bones, it was determined he died from exposure. So with Jeff's discovery, there were naturally a lot of questions. The first one being, why did Jeff 
wade into an icy river and place his pack on a rock and then take everything out and lay it out on this rock only to then abandon his pack and walk 1000 meters upstream and sit down at a tree and start taking his clothes off. And even if he had a good reason to leave his pack and go upstream to that tree, he would have known that if he doesn't go back down to get the contents from in that pack, he was going to die. His legs weren't broken, he could walk, but he didn't. He sat at the tree until he died. And regardless of the pack mystery, why did he leave the trail in the first place? The last thing he said to his scoutmaster was he was going to sit on the trail and wait for the senior scout to finish eating and come meet him. He was not indicating that he was going to go anywhere. He was actually saying, I'm going to be right here. So there's nothing about his behavior that indicated he wanted to voluntarily leave the trail. Yet, based on what they saw, it looked like as soon as his scoutmaster turned around and walked down the trail, Jeff must have hopped up and ran off the trail and jumped into the river and taken his pack off and ran up to the tree and taken some clothes off and sat down and slowly died. Now, of course, none of this makes any sense, unless you consider an alternative theory put forth by people involved in the search. And that was Jeff was abducted. In that moment of time when he was sitting on the trail and his scoutmaster had walked away and the senior scout had not finished eating yet, so had not seen Jeff yet, while he's sitting there by himself, somebody was in the tree line watching Jeff, saw this moment of weakness and rushed up and took him. That theory does explain a lot of the strangeness around the scene where Jeff was found, but it requires someone to abduct Jeff for no clear reason. They weren't even interested in Jeff. They brought him down to the tree and then were just kind of curious about him. They didn't physically harm him. They kept him from going anywhere and that ultimately harmed him, but there were no marks on him. He was not attacked. And then after he passed or shortly before, they just took his pack and were rifling through it and putting it on the rock and looking at each piece inside the pack, but they didn't take anything. They left it where it was and then they vanished. But what kind of a person is just hanging out along the Appalachian Trail, randomly abducting people and toying with them as if they're a child toying with an ant? In 2006, 38 year old Corey Kelly contacted his good friend, Jim Naprud to see if he wanted to go grouse hunting with him. Grouse are a type of game bird. Jim agreed and the pair decided to meet at the Red Lake State Wildlife Management Area in Fortown, Minnesota, which was not far from where either of them lived. So the two men, along with Jim's dog named Sammy, arrive at the campsite on October 16th. They get out, they start setting up the campsite, putting the tent up, getting all their food laid out. And that's when Jim realizes they did not bring gasoline. So he says to Corey, he's gonna go into town and get some gasoline. Corey said he would stay back and continue setting up the campsite, maybe go out and get some firewood. And he would look after Sammy while Jim was gone. When Jim pulled away from the campsite, he turned and saw Corey carrying a shotgun with Sammy by his side, walking into the woods. And so Jim assumed he must be heading into the woods to go grouse hunting. An hour and a half later, when Jim came back to the campsite, Corey and Sammy were gone. Now at first, Jim wasn't concerned at all. He figured Corey was still out grouse hunting and that he and Sammy would be back any minute. And so Jim hops out of his truck and he continues setting up camp. He goes out and gets some firewood. The whole time he's kind of looking around the woods, waiting for Corey and Sammy to you know, make a sound or show themselves and they don't. And as the sun goes down, Jim's starting to feel a little bit more worried. And so he gets his phone out and he tries calling Corey, but the cell phone reception's so bad, he can't place a call. Jim knew Corey was extremely competent in the outdoors. He was an avid hunter and he knew this area really, really well. However, he thought it is possible he could have gotten turned around while he was out grouse hunting, and so I should signal where the campsite is. And so for several hours, Jim honked his horn and flashed his truck's lights in hopes that Corey would see or hear him. Finally, after midnight, when Corey and Sammy had not returned, Jim decided, you know what, I'm psyching myself out. I'm sure they're fine. They'll be back in the morning. I don't know what happened, but I trust Corey can handle himself. So Jim falls asleep and very early the next morning when he gets up, he's looking around, hoping he's gonna see Corey and Sammy. They're still not there. And so Jim begins to search the area himself. Jim walks two miles into this forest. It's very thick, it's very swampy. He sees no sign of Corey or Sammy and he's yelling for them. He's trying to call Corey on his phone, but there's no reception. And so he turned around and walked back to the campsite, now trying to dial 911, but even that wasn't going through. It was a total dead zone. And then luckily he saw some campers that were out near his campsite and he asked them to try calling 911 and their call did go through. The police show up and they begin searching this forest and they find almost right away that it's so difficult to walk 
in this forest because of how swampy and marshy it is that they have ATVs brought in just so they can do a basic search of the forest. And for two straight weeks, they looked everywhere in this forest for Corey and Sammy and there was nothing, no sign of them. Then on October 25th, nine miles away from where Jim and Corey's campsite was, two hunters found Sammy wandering around the forest and she was hungry and dehydrated, but overall she was in good health. And so they tried to get her to track to wherever Corey was, but she wasn't doing it. At this point, the focus of the search was shifted to where Sammy was found, and they began searching that area, and three days later, they found Corey's cigarettes and his lighter. The following day, they found Corey's overalls, socks, and sweatshirts, now 14 miles from where Jim and Corey's campsite was. But even after finding all these things that belonged to Corey in a relatively small area, they looked and they couldn't find Corey. And then the weather started to get really bad and it started to snow in the area and they had to postpone the search. The search was started up again in mid-November and they brought out all these scent sniffing dogs and they searched that area near where all his things were found for 13 more days, but again, they couldn't find anything. And then another wave of bad weather came in and they had to postpone the search again, this time for the whole winter. They began looking for Corey for a third time the following year on April 28th by flying a plane over the area where all of his clothes had been found and they were able to spot Corey's body. He was laying right in the middle of the swamp, right in the middle of the tall grass. It was determined he died of hypothermia on the first night he went missing which means he had to have run a mind-boggling 14 miles through this forest before winding up in the swamp. And if you remember on the very first search for him, the police were unable to just walk around the forest because of how swampy and wet it was. They had to bring in ATVs just to look around. And so the idea that Corey was able to run 14 miles in this swampy forest seemed impossible. In fact, that's what searchers said, it was impossible unless you were being pursued. If you think your life is in danger, you will do things that you cannot do unless your life is in danger. Adrenaline makes it that way. Lending credit to the idea he might have been pursued by someone or something is where he was found. He was found in the middle of the swamp, in the tall grass. There was a hard packed path about 15 feet away from where he was found that he could have very easily gotten to but he chose to be in the swamp, in the tall grass. So you gotta ask yourself, if you were in Corey's position and you had the choice between standing in knee deep water in the middle of a swamp in the tall grass where there are other dangerous predators in the swamp, or you can just stand on a path and be safe, which would you choose? Well, obviously you'd choose the path under normal conditions, but if you were trying to hide from someone, you might choose the tall grass. The last time Jim saw Corey, he was walking into the woods with Sammy carrying his shotgun. But when they found Corey in the marsh, there was no gun. And in fact, that gun was never recovered, but they did find an expended shotgun shell casing basically along the path they think Corey took to get to the marsh. He did have his cell phone on him, but from what I read, it looked like either he didn't use it or he just never had any service. Corey's death was ruled an accident, even though many people believe it's far more likely he was being pursued by someone or something, because it's just not normal human behavior to in the middle of the night, get up and run 14 miles through a swamp. Fuji is the highest mountain in Japan, rising up to 3,776 meters, and it's actually a volcano. It's dormant. The last time it erupted was in 1707, but geologists still classify it as active. Tourists are allowed to climb Mount Fuji, but only between July and September, because in the winter months, the mountain gets completely treacherous. There's snow and ice, and the wind picks up. It's very, very dangerous, so it's off limits. Now, thrill seekers, if they really wanted to, they could climb Mount Fuji in the winter because there isn't a security guard posted up at the bottom of Mount Fuji checking people in and out. It's on you. If you want to climb it when it's off limits, well, then you're climbing at your own risk because basically it's a terrible idea. But if you have the right equipment and you have all the right training, it is doable. One thrill seeker, a 47-year-old named Tedzu, decided he wanted to hike Mount Fuji in the winter of 2019. He wanted to live stream his entire journey to the summit. Now, Tedzu might have been a thrill seeker, 
but he certainly wasn't a mountain climber. He did not have the experience, nor did he have any of the equipment necessary for a climb up Mount Fuji in the winter. Wearing only street clothes and carrying nothing more than climbing poles and his smartphone, he turned on his live stream and he began hiking up the Shubashiri Trail. Viewers began tuning in as Ted Zoo happily made his way up this ash-covered trail, and then the ash turned into light snow, and then light snow turned into really heavy snow and ice and wind, and then Ted Zoo began complaining about how cold he was and how he couldn't feel his hands, and his viewers are egging him on to you know keep going, keep pushing through it, and probably because of the pressure he felt from his viewers, he kept going when really this would have been the moment to turn around. When you're realizing that you don't have the right equipment and it's getting really cold and you're probably not even halfway up, that's the time to turn around, but, but he didn't. He pressed on. As he moved up the mountain, the path he was on continued to narrow and become increasingly more covered in ice. And the guard fence that straddled the side of this path was getting to the place where it comes to a stop, signaling the most dangerous section of the hike, which is the last leg up to the summit. He gets to that point where the fence comes to an end, and now he's on this narrow stretch where the wind is just whipping across and it's all ice, and he's trying to walk across the ice with this totally inappropriate footwear. He should have had on at least crampons, the metal spikes that go on the bottom of your shoe to grip ice. He just had tennis shoes on, and so he's slipping and sliding as he's walking up this icy trail, and then he finally staggers and falls, but he catches himself. And you can hear him laughing on the live stream, joking with his audience how, how dangerous and slippery it is, and his viewers begin to change their tone a little bit, and they're like, hey, you might want to consider turning around now, but Ted Zoo is totally focused on getting to the top. So he stands back up and he continues to kind of shuffle his way towards the summit on this stretch of ice. He finally gets right up below the summit to where on his live stream you can actually see the top of Mount Fuji. And you can tell that his footwear at this point is basically not able to handle how slick it is. He's basically constantly stumbling. And you can see he notices a little stretch of small rocks that seem to almost make stepping stones up to the summit. And he begins walking over very carefully on the ice to try to use these rocks to get himself up to the top. And right as he's trying to step for one of these rocks, he loses his balance. And on camera, he says, wait, I'm slipping. And then he falls and begins rocketing down the side of this mountain. Now, when you fall on a steep mountain, you have one, maybe two chances to self-arrest. So for example, if you had an ice pick and you were like Ted Zoo and you start falling, you would wanna roll over and dig the head of that ice pick into the ground and basically anchor your knees and elbows and drive everything you can into the snow to stop yourself from falling. And so if you can't do that in one or two attempts, your momentum will pick up and you'll be going too fast and you won't be able to stop yourself. And then you just gotta hope you survive the fall. Ted Zhu did not have an ice pick or any other tool to help himself arrest. And he didn't have the training for what to do in a situation like this. So he didn't even attempt to roll over and dig his elbows or knees into the ground to try to slow down. So he just goes flying down the mountain. He's on his back, he's not slowing down and he knows he's doomed. And he says on camera, well, it can't be helped before he flies over the edge and falls hundreds of meters down to his death. His viewers who watched this happen alerted authorities who found his body the next day over a thousand meters away from where he had first fallen. Unfortunately, every year there is a handful of people that attempt to climb Mount Fuji in the winter and they meet the same fate. On May 2nd, 2000, at approximately midnight Eastern Standard Time, the U.S. government discontinued its use of selective availability. Selective availability was the intentional degradation of public GPS signals. It guaranteed that civilian GPS users would not be able to pinpoint locations on a map using their GPS. They could get to within maybe 50 to 100 meters, but that was the best they could do. Prior to the year 2000, there was some concern that if you gave the general public the ability to use GPS to precisely locate things on a map, that that presented an elevated national security risk. But that line of thinking became antiquated. And so on May 2nd, just after midnight, the so-called Great Blue Switch, as GPS enthusiasts refer to it, was flipped and instantly tens of thousands of GPS receivers received this incredible upgrade. People who were following this development were eager to test out this new capability. And one such GPS enthusiast, a guy named Dave Ulmer, who lived in Oregon, decided he wanted to create a sort of GPS treasure hunt. So he got this box and inside of it, he put a notebook and a pen and he brought it out to the middle of the woods in Oregon and he got the precise GPS coordinates of where he put it. 
and he took those coordinates and he went to an online forum and he posted the coordinates and he said, go to these coordinates and when you get there, if you find what you're looking for, there'll be a notebook. Record yourself in the notebook and I'll be out there to check who's done this. And if your name's in there, I'll give you credit on this forum. And so this treasure hunt went viral and lots of people all over the world thought it was a really cool idea to use this new GPS technology to create treasure hunts all over the world. So people started hiding not just treasure chests with notebooks, but all sorts of random things all over the world and then posting their coordinates online for people to find. This activity was given a name, geocaching, and it's alive and well today and it's streamlined on the official geocaching app. But as geocaching has evolved over the years, so too has the level of difficulty at finding some of these caches. Sometimes it requires geocachers to climb mountains, other times it requires them to dive underwater, and in one case, geocachers in the Czech Republic had to climb into this strictly off-limits, five-kilometer-long underground tunnel where the only two entry points were on the two extreme ends, and to get to the geocache, you had to go to the middle of the tunnel. And of course, periodically, this tunnel completely floods. On June 9th, 2018, four geocachers in the Czech Republic decided, you know what, we're gonna go down into that tunnel and we're gonna get that geocache. So they made their way over to the Matulski Brook Tunnel, which was one of the two entry points, and they climbed down inside. The reason this tunnel periodically floods is because rainwater gets dumped in there, and the second entry point is literally sitting in a lake. There is literally water sitting right up against the lip of this entry point. So even light rain will get the lake to rise just enough to where all the lake water pours into this tunnel. And so the day these four geocachers are going into this tunnel, the weather forecast called for torrential downpours, flash flooding, and either these four geocachers were not paying attention to the weather, or they somehow thought this wouldn't affect their ability to get this geocache. So these geocachers get down into the tunnel and they start making their way towards the center to collect their prize when outside it starts pouring rain. It rained so much so fast that the lake entrance started dumping tens of thousands of gallons of water in on one side and then on the other side where this other entrance was at the bottom of a hill you had all this water rushing in so it was like two huge waves of water crashing in on them and in fact the survivors would say because they were right towards the middle of the tunnel they heard what sounded like a car or like a train. It was getting closer and closer and closer. And that's when they realized it was two waves of water crashing in on them. In a panic, they turned and started running back towards the entrance they came in on. But as they're running, they're hit with this wave and two of the geocachers got sucked underneath and the other two were pushed up and were basically body surfing their way towards the lake entrance. And so as they're moving forward, the wave from the lake comes in and hits them, and now the water is dangerously close to the ceiling, and the two that have been pushed towards the lake entrance, they don't know what's happened to the other two, but they're just swimming as fast as they can towards the lake entrance. And they swam almost two kilometers in this tunnel as the water got higher and higher and higher, and they're barely able to breathe by the end. They only had about a couple inches of clearance by the time they got to the lake, and they finally popped out and they get in the lake and then luckily there was someone that saw them and brought their boat over and picked them up. As for their two friends, unfortunately, they didn't get out of there in time and they both drowned. There's an island off the coast of Croatia called Šolta. Only 19 kilometers long by five kilometers wide, this tiny island is a short ferry ride and an ideal day trip from Split, which is Croatia's second biggest city. It's a hilly island with these beautiful pebble beaches and absolutely crystal clear water. It's a very popular tourist destination that's actually famous for its honey, as well as an underwater cave that kills virtually everyone who goes inside. On September 10th, 2002, 31-year-old Miroslav Kuklis was enjoying a vacation with friends on Šolta Island. It was a little after 8.30 in the evening when one of his friends suggested they go scuba diving. Because of its beautiful clear waters, Šolta Island is a very popular scuba diving destination. And so as such, scuba diving takes place really at all hours around Šolta Island, but the vast majority of it takes place in these safe, 
little alcoves where it's not very deep and you can see fish and wildlife and it's very controlled. But Miroslav and his friends didn't want to do regular scuba diving. They wanted to check out the underwater cave they had heard about just south of Sholta Island in Poganica Bay. They had heard this cave was extremely dangerous and only expert divers were allowed to go in there. And even though they were not expert divers, they were barely novice divers, they thought, you know what, how bad can it be? Let's go check it out for ourselves. So they convinced one of the boat drivers to drive them out to the area in Poganica Bay that sat over where this cave entrance was. And so they put on their gear, they hop in his boat, they drive out, they jump in the water, and sure enough, right below the surface, about 10 meters down, is this hole on the sea floor. And that is the single entrance into this cave. When you go in this hole, you have to go down head first because it's so tight. And once you go down about 10 meters, you reach this junction where to one side, it leads to the shallow gallery, which is the space that goes down to 36 meters, and there's no other caves or entrances or anything off of it. It's just kind of like a chasm inside of the cave. From the junction, if you go the other way, it brings you to the deep gallery, which is just a bigger version of the shallow gallery, and it goes down to 57 meters. Inside of the deep gallery, however, at the very top on the ceiling, there is a very thin air pocket. Now there's a few reasons why this cave is so dangerous beyond just being an underwater cave, which in and of itself is quite dangerous. The first one is the visibility inside of the cave is basically zero. The only light that comes in is through that single entrance that leads to that junction, but the light doesn't make it past the junction into the two galleries. So it is truly pitch black inside of those two galleries. You also have all this silt that's caked to the inside of the cave. So as soon as you get in there, your flippers and your movement, it kicks the silt off the wall and muddies the water around you to where even if you had a flashlight, it's like driving in fog. The lights only pick up the fog right in front of you. You can't see beyond the fog. Well, in a tunnel, you shine your light on silt and you're just gonna see the silt, not beyond it. So basically going into this cave, you're gonna be blindfolded. Another significant danger of being inside of this cave is after you've gone down to your respective gallery, whether it's the shallow or the deep gallery, when you're going back up again on your ascent and you're getting to that junction point, it is possible to confuse the other entrance to the other gallery with the exit to the cave. And so if you make that mistake and you go into the other gallery, remember, you're blind, you got silt kicked up, it's already dark, you need to, by touch, figure out you've made a mistake and then backtrack and go out the right way you came. And so if you're low on air and you make this mistake, you better hope you catch it fast enough that you can get out before your air runs out. So a little after 9.15 p.m., Miroslav goes in first, followed by his other two friends. Miroslav reaches the junction and he turns towards the deep gallery. He goes all the way down to 57 meters, he touches the bottom, he turns around, and he starts making his ascent. On the way up, he gets to the junction, and he makes the critical mistake of going into the shallow gallery, believing that is the exit to the cave. He probably got in there, bumped his head, started feeling around, he's kicking up silt, he's starting to panic, he's looking for the way out again. He finds the exit to the junction, but instead of taking the exit out of the cave, he makes the same mistake again and goes into the deep gallery. And now he's in the deep gallery, he's feeling around, he's running low on air, and based on his dive computer, he was fumbling around in there for quite some time. And having spent some time underwater myself in the pitch black as a Navy SEAL, I can tell you that it's very easy to imagine, you know, oh, it'd be so easy to stay calm and have your bearings and know where you are. But when you are completely in total pitch black underwater, it actually is hard to tell what's up, what's down. You can feel the pressure in your ears. That's a good way to tell where you are in the water. But you know, realistically, it's, it's totally possible to get completely disoriented underwater. And my guess is Miroslav was totally disoriented. And so he stopped and he's trying to make sense of what's happening. And at some point, Miroslav must have looked at his air gauge and realized, I'm out of air now and he made one last push to try to get to the surface, but he hit a ceiling, and that's when he realized, based on maybe the touch and feel, maybe he took his gloves off and he was feeling around, he felt that he was in the air pocket, that thin amount of air that sat right at the top of the deep gallery. He must have realized at this point that there was so little air down here that he probably only had maybe a few minutes that he could be down here breathing before he was going to drown. And in terms of making his ascent to the surface on a breath hold, the only place where there's an air pocket is the deep gallery. And so probably he knew that. And so he's thinking, I'm, you know, maybe 40, 50 meters under the surface right now, and I can barely catch my breath now. I'm not gonna be able to hold my breath to the surface. And so staring down a certain horrific drowning death, he pulled out his dive knife 
and he plunged it into his heart. And when they did his autopsy later, it would show he did not drown. He died because he had a knife in his heart. Back on the surface, the other two divers had gotten out successfully and they're in the boat and they're waiting for Miroslav. But after over an hour went by and he hadn't surfaced, they contacted the police. The police show up and they send two special divers down into the cave to look for Miroslav. One of those divers was a 25 year old named Oliver Merich. And so these two divers go down and they're looking for Miroslav and they can't find him and they're running out of air. And on their ascent, Oliver Merich makes the same mistake that Miroslav did and gets trapped inside of the shallow gallery. The other diver initially made that mistake but managed to get out again, but Oliver went back and forth between the deep and the shallow gallery until he too drowned in that cave. It would take three days for the police to find and remove Miroslav and Oliver from this cave. And to this day, the police warn divers not to go in this cave unless they're experienced enough to be going in there. But year after year, inexperienced divers try their luck inside of this cave and they make that same mistake, they get trapped and they die.